guess we should give people a couple more minutes to join. Доктор Susanna, we've got enough people to get going. Oh, you're muted. Unmute myself. Um, yes, we, we can do the introductions and then that'll be a couple of minutes anyways. Okay. Still going. All right. Welcome everyone. Uh, so this is the last <clears throat> lecture in our virtual astronomy day series today. Uh, so my name is Gord Perelman, President of RAS Vancouver Center, and uh, now we have a presentation by Susanna Nagy, who is a past president of the Vancouver Center and our current membership director, and she's going to be showing us and talking about meteorites from the Jim Bernath collection. So I will hand things over to Susanna. Okay. Uh, hi, Hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining me today to celebrate International Astronomy Day and Science Rendezvous. Uh, normally, we would all be together in the halls of Simon Fraser University Burnaby Mountain celebrating with uh, dozens of interactive displays and activities for everyone and children to enjoy being, unfortunately, things the way they are. I'm going to do my best to show you the Jim Bernath Meteorite Collection virtually. Uh, I'm going to do that with this pen-like microscope with a camera on the end, which is attached to my laptop via USB cord. And then what I'm seeing on my screen when I share screen, well, you will be able to see as well. Um, it is a handheld device. I am going to do my best not to shake too much. And as I zoom in and out, there's going to be some blurriness on an, um, back and forth uh, on the screen. So bear with me uh, while I, I focus uh, each meteorite for you as I'm chatting. Being that I need both hands for this, I do have a chat monitor helping me today. That is Michael Levy. Uh, he will be monitoring the chat as I'm just not going to be able to focus on that. Michael. Uh, will be answering any questions you might have if he can, and then posing any other questions to me. So please feel free to put your questions onto the chat, either to everyone or to Michael privately, and he will uh, monitor that for me while I'm doing this. 
So to start, uh, I've got a very brief PowerPoint presentation. It's only about eight slides. So I'm going to share screen now. It says host has disabled screen sharing. Gordon? Yep, yeah, sorry, I missed that step. I uh, should be fine now. OK. There we go. All right, so I'm going to move over to PowerPoint. And slideshow from the beginning. OK, very good. All right, this doesn't seem to be one and be moving. Oh, there we go. Okay, so this is the Jim Bernath Meteorite Collection. So I do wish to say just a few words about Jim Bernath. Who is Jim Bernath and why this Meteorite Collection is named after him? So Jim was a longtime member and very good friend of the RASC Vancouver Center. Uh, he was an avid collector of space artifacts and memorabilia and he collected uh, artifacts throughout the decades. Uh, he would regularly fill his van with his collection and travel across Canada and even into the United States, sharing his collection with the public. He would be invited into schools, into libraries, even shopping malls to set up his displays where he would enthusiastically engage with the public and he especially enjoyed engaging with children. He was unique in that, like, like most collectors, they keep their collections private. Jim really enjoyed sharing them. So it was very sad when Jim passed away in January of 2019. Uh, on his passing, we here at Vancouver Center were able to acquire quite a, a good portion of his artifacts, including his meteorite collection. We have about 20 meteorites in this collection now, which if we were meeting in person, uh, you'd be able to use uh, microscopes and magnifying glasses to look at and even pick up some of them yourself. So a few words uh, for some facts for you. What is the difference? It's a question we get asked often. What is the difference between comets, asteroids, meteoroids, meteors, and meteorites? So comets, are the leftover material from the formation of our solar system. Um, the, they're mostly formed past the orbit of Jupiter. Now comets are made of ice, not rock. That's a very important distinction. Comets are made of ice. And as sometimes happens, these comets make their way into the inner solar system where we are closer to the sun. The ice is then heated by the sun, melting it into water, quickly vaporizing it into gas, which causes that tail that we so identify comets with. So this particular photo is Comet Neowise that passed by our planet in uh, summer of 2020. I had the chance to see it. I hope others did as well. Asteroids are made up of rock. Again, the distinction with a comet, comets are ice, asteroids are rocks, also left over from the formation of our solar system. Uh, there's no defined size for an asteroid. It can range from a few meters in size to many, many kilometers across. The largest asteroid in our system is Ceres, located in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. It was discovered in 1801, and we now know it to be 940 kilometers across. So Ceres is, has been reclassified as a dwarf planet. Meteoroids. So meteoroids are small chunks of rock likely broken off from an asteroid. Meteoroids can be as small as a grain of sand or as large as a meter across. Again, there's no defined size between an asteroid and a meteoroid. A meteoroid is a small chunk of rock while an asteroid is just a larger chunk of rock. Now a meteor, when a meteoroid gets close enough to the earth that it enters our atmosphere and begins to burn up, it's called a meteor. It has that bright tail of light that we um, associate meteor showers with. And sometimes they're also called shooting stars. So we've got a number of meteor showers that occur on a regular basis that we can see here 
in the lower mainland. Uh, the one that's most celebrated is the one in August, the Perseid meteor shower. That is because the weather is what it is here in the lower mainland. Our fall, winter, and spring tend to be rain-filled or clouded over, but we're usually guaranteed some good August clear skies. So the Perseid meteor shower is one that we often go out and take a look at. So then when a meteor or a meteoroid survives its trip through our atmosphere and hits the ground, it is then called a meteorite. That is the end of the PowerPoint presentation. So let me end that and turn on the camera. Okay. Oh, apologize for moving that so quickly. So I've got a dime here on this cloth just so you can get an idea of size as I'm putting the meteorites each in front of you. So I'm going to start with this one. This is the Allende meteorite. Entered our atmosphere on February 8th, 1969 over the town of Allende, Mexico in the state of Chihuahua. It is a stony meteorite. Now meteorites come in three main categories. Those three categories are stony, iron, and stony slash iron. Really not very fancy names. But each of these three categories have multiple subcategories depending on the minerals that are in there, how much iron is in there. I'm not going to get technical with those, but I am going to show you meteorites from all three categories. So the Allende meteorite is a stony meteorite. And it is estimated that when it entered our atmosphere in February of 1969, it, it was about three tons worth of material. As most meteorites do, they tend to shatter uh, as they enter our atmosphere. So pieces of it were scattered over a 150 square kilometer area. Um, as a result, over two tons of meteorite pieces were found, making it the best studied meteorite in history. It is a carbonaceous chondrite meteorite, the largest carbonaceous chondrite meteorite ever found on Earth, I'm told. Uh, carbonaceous, as the name suggests, it does have a lot of carbon in it. Uh, and of course, there are uh, carbon or the uh, carbon is the also a great, uh, sorry, I'm trying to find my words here. Many of us know another uh, item of carbon, and that is diamonds. And so there are pieces of the Allende, you'll find Allende meteorites, some of them do have diamonds in it. This one does not, but I'm going to flip it over because it is smoothed and, uh, and shiny on the bottom. So I'm just going to zoom in, bear with me. While I'm zooming, I am focusing. So you can see that uh, it's got these little pieces of minerals in it. The IND meteorite has abundant calcium and aluminum rich inclusions. Okay, so another one way to tell a meteorite just from an ordinary rock, I'm gonna flip it over again now that I'm close up, is a lot of them have this black burnt exterior to it. That is as a result of the friction it encountered as it was entering our atmosphere. So zooming out, focusing. All right, so this is the Allende meteorite, a stony meteorite, entered our atmosphere February 8th, 1969. Moving over to the next meteorite, placing it next to the dime so that you can see relative size. This is an example of a stony iron meteorite found in 1861 in Vasa Muerte, Chile. Also estimated as it entered our atmosphere to be 3.8 tons. As it broke up, the impact was strewn over 11 kilometers. It has also been well researched and is found to be 47% iron 
40% silicate and 13% trolite. I am going to flip this one over as well. It is also smoothed on the bottom. Going to zoom in, bear with me while I focus as I'm doing so. So you can see, there we go, some of those minerals in there. Trying to get that focus. There we go. I think that's about as good as I can get it. So again, this is the Fasa Moete meteorite, stony iron from Chile, found in 1861. All right, flipping that over, zooming out. Okay, then out of side. I am now going to show you an example of a uh, sorry, looking at my notes here. So this is stony iron. This is a stony iron meteorite. Again, placed next to the dime for relative size. You can see this one is quite small. This is also a slice. I'm just going to move it here so you can see it's not a chunk of rock. It's actually just a slice. This meteorite was found in Esquel, Argentina in 1951 discovered by farmers digging a well. It is considered to be one of the most beautiful meteorites ever found on Earth. That's not my saying, that is the meteoritical scientific community that has designated this meteorite the most beautiful ever found on Earth. I'm gonna zoom in and show you why. So being a stony iron, it's got different minerals in it. Bear with me while I focus that for you. There we go. You can see it's got some colorations in there. So a lot of stony me iron meteorites uh, contain silicates. And this particular piece has yellow green olivine crystals in it. So I'm trying to focus in just a little bit more. You can see there's been some green and yellow in there. Focusing out. Sorry, zooming out, focusing while I do so. There we go. So again, the stony iron meteorite found in Esquel, Argentina in 1951. All right, moving that one off, bringing in the next one, placing it next to the dime so you can see its size. This is also a slice not a whole piece, showing you that, glued onto this piece of metal so that we don't lose it. Now, iron meteorites are one of the most rare meteorites found. They only make up about 5% of the meteorites that are ever found on Earth. Iron meteorites, as their name suggests, are made up mostly of iron and other metals like nickel. It's thought that they come from the cores of the asteroids. Now, I'm gonna zoom in because Iron meteorites often have these very interesting patterns to them. Bear with, oops, sorry for shaking. Bear with me. Zooming in. Okay. These are called Winmanstaten, although if you're German, as I was corrected the other day, it's properly pronounced Winmanstaten. I hope I got that right, Carl. Winmanstaten discovered by the Austrian Alois von Beck Finmenstaten in 1808. So due to the intense pressure that these asteroids and then eventually meteoroids, meteors and meteorites go under, they develop these patterns in them. These patterns, you cannot find them on any rock on Earth, at least we haven't so far, and they cannot be recreated in the laboratory. They have only ever been found in iron meteorites. Fortunately, I don't know where this one was found or when. When we obtained uh, Jim Bernath's meteorite collection, some of them were labeled well, others even had some of their certificates of authenticity, authenticity, but there were a few like this one I don't have any detail on. 
other than it is an iron meteorite and a good example of Vinman Staten patterns. All right, zooming out. Placing this one aside. And bear with me while I grab the next one. Sorry, I gotta reach over for it. All right, bringing it in. Again, placing it next to the dime so that you can see size comparison. Also a slice, not a full piece. This uh, is a stony meteorite. Location found was Chico, New Mexico, New Mexico, United States, 1954. Now this is a unique one. This meteorite actually melted as it was entering our atmosphere. And it also melted the rock that it eventually crashed into. When it was first discovered, they weren't even sure it was a meteorite because of its blobby nature. Um, but because of the fact that it was melting as it entered our atmosphere, there were air bubbles created. So I'm gonna zoom in. Zooming in, focusing, bear with me while I focus that for you. Air, you can see it's got little holes. So those are air bubble holes created when this meteorite was melting as it entered our atmosphere. Again, found in Chico, New Mexico in 1954. Okay, zooming out, focusing. Okay, let me set this one aside. Bear with me while I place that over. Okay, sorry for the shaking. Switching hands, I'm bringing the next one in. This is under glass, so there's going to be a bit of a glare from the light on the camera. I'm going to try and angle this to reduce that glare as much as I can. Focusing in for you. Again, you can see the blackened burnt exterior of this meteorite. Sorry, that's me shaking. I'm trying to use my non-dominant hand. Oh, I misplaced the dime. Oh, well, here's my fingertip. There we go. <laughs> All right, it's small. Now, this is one of my favorites. Doesn't it, isn't anything special to look at, but I remember the day that this entered our atmosphere. Approximately 9.20 a.m. on February 15th, 2013, so only eight years ago. This came or entered our atmosphere over Russia. I'm just going to move up and show you a little map. I'm going to change hands again, try and get my dominant hand holding it. There we go. So it came, entered over Russia, over the town of Chelyabinsk, approximately 66 feet in diameter with a speed of 19 kilometers per second. Due to its high velocity and the shallow angle that it entered our atmosphere, it exploded in the air at a height of approximately 29 kilometers. This uh, explosion created a shock wave that burst out the windows of approximately 7,000 buildings in Chelyabinsk and approximately 1,500 people were so injured by flying gas, glass that they had to be hospitalized. Here's a picture of the shattered windows in the foyer of the Chelyabinsk Drama Theater. And so this is a piece of that. I can't believe we actually have a piece of this. That's too cool. I actually got a YouTube video showing um, it entering our atmosphere. A lot of people caught it on dash cam video and security footage. So bear with me. I'm gonna, it's gonna shake a little bit while I move this over. Place the pen down. I'm going to minimize this. Go to YouTube. Okay. 
And I'm going to play this. Hopefully you all will be able to see and hear it. Let me know if you can't. It's only one minute long. It's not long at all. The end of this video, you're going to see or hear actually glass shattering. There we go. There's a lot more videos if anyone wants to uh, Google that. I'm, oops, going back to the camera. Okay. All right. Let me, all right. I'm actually going to move the dime over. I don't need the dime for this one. I've only got a couple of more to show you, uh, but I think I'll get a kick out of this next one. Apologize. Let me focus that. I'm going to bring it in. Place it down, okay. So this is an example of a stony meteorite. This is one of the ones, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of detail on. I don't know where it was found or when, except that I know that to be a stony meteorite. Focusing in, you can see the blackened and burnt exterior. Identifying this as a meteorite. Zooming out. Now, rather than putting the dime over that, I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to pick it up. <laughs> I mean, how cool is that? <laughs> this is a two pound meteorite. So, next year, when you come up to SFU to see us at our meteorite collection table, I'm going to give this to you so you can hold it in your hand as well. Beautiful. Uh, so one of the ways, another way to uh, identify a meteorite, not only from its blackened exterior is, as I've mentioned, a lot of them, most meteorites have a lot of metals, iron and nickel. So I have an ordinary fridge magnet here, which I am going to attach onto the meteorite. You can hear that click, I hope. I'll do it again. I'm going to do it on the side. You can see it doesn't fall off. I'm actually going to use the meteorite and pick up. You can see it's hanging off. So there's a lot of metal in this hunk of rock. So that's a really good way to discern whether or not you think a rock is a meteorite or not. Uh, as an example of another rock, I just picked this up in the garden the other day. I am going to try and put the magnet onto this rock. You can see it falls off, won't stick. I'm going to try and pick up the magnet. You see it is not getting picked up. So this little rock does not have enough metal in, metal in there to activate the magnet. However, I can pick up this one with it. So this is a meteorite, stony meteorite, two pounds in weight. Now meteorites come, as I mentioned before, in many different sizes, moving this one off. They, as you've seen, they can come as small as a dime or as large as two pounds, but they also come 
as micrometeorites. Here's that dime again, just to show you the size. Micrometeorites. These micrometeorites were picked up near the Behringer Crater in Arizona. How do I know that these are micrometeorites? Again, here is the little fridge magnet picking up the micrometeorites. Doing that again. It's just, uh, these little micrometeorites are stuck between two pieces of tape so that we don't lose them. Using the magnet to pick up the micrometeorites. Now you can actually find micrometeorites yourself around your own house. A lot of meteorite debris enters our solar system every single day. It is, I said that, approximately 50 tons, that's five zero, 50 tons of meteorite material enters our atmosphere every single day. Very likely these little micrometeorites are lying around your house. So I am going to actually stop sharing screen so that you all can see me and I'm gonna show you something. So you need a bag, maybe a vegetable, the kind you get at the vegetable store to put the fruits and vegetables in or a Ziploc bag would also work well. You would place your fridge magnet with your hand inside the bag. Now I would probably wait a week in between rains because rain is just gonna wash everything away. But if you can wait a week when there's been no rain, find a sidewalk that isn't walked upon too much or a part of your driveway that isn't driven over too much and just gently swipe the magnet over the surface. And once you think you've picked up a few pieces, just flip the bag inside out. Everything inside of the bag will now be a micrometeorite. Another really good place to find micrometeorites is actually on the roof of your house. Not that I'm suggesting everyone start jumping up and running to get the ladder and climbing onto the roof of your house. Uh, but if mom and dad are on the roof cleaning the skylights, or cleaning the gutters, maybe you can remind them to take a fridge magnet and a bag and see if they can find any micrometeorites for you. And with that, that finishes up my meteorite collection presentation. Uh, I can take any questions if there happen to be any, Michael. Um, I answered some of the questions in the chat, but one of the questions that came up is what is the chances of somebody being struck by a meteor when they're just walking in Stanley Park? <laughs> Good question. Uh, there, it has happened. There have been rec uh, reports of meteorites coming through people's houses. I remember seeing one in the news where it came through the roof of their house and landed in their bedroom. So it is possible. Um, chances minimal microtesimal really but as with anything and it can happen but more often than not the meteorites are micrometeorites you really don't feel them at all uh, should you happen to to encounter one as you're walking along the uh, stanley park seawall and another question which i think i gave the right answer to but perhaps you can con confirm is I claim the difference between a bolide and a meteor is that a bolide is merely a meteor that happens to look like a fireball when it, when it comes into the Earth's atmosphere. Very true. I've had actually the opportunity to see one a number of years ago. We were watching the August Perseid meteor shower and out of the corner of my eye, I caught a fireball. It was the coolest thing. It scared me until I realized what it was. But yes, uh, a meteor, can cert if it's big enough, can certainly flare up and create a fireball. And it's called a bolide. Uh, and the big ones, are, as uh, Michael mentioned, super bolides. If you park your car on the outside, you're collecting micrometeorites. All you have to do is catch what you wash. <laughs> yes. Someone asked about the density of, um, of meteors, and I said it just depended on the type. I'm assuming the iron ones are a lot heavier than the carbon-based ones. Absolutely. Absolutely, they are much, much heavier. 
um, stony iron meteorites, and of course stony meteorites carry a lot of other minerals in them, as I mentioned, silicates, um, aluminums, um, so there's a, quite a variety of minerals you will find carbon, but the iron meteorites are the most dense, the most heavy, and, um, and so they will weigh the most um, when they, they enter, when you find them, absolutely. If that's it, um, that concludes my presentation. Thank you everyone so much for watching. Thank you, Michael, for your help. Mm -hmm. I'll pass it over to Gordon for closing remarks. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Susanna. Uh, excellent presentation. Um, yeah, so that's the last of our uh, presentations for Astronomy Day. I hope uh, everyone enjoyed what we showed today. Um, so if you're interested in seeing something else, we do have our regular Thursday lecture coming up this week. Uh, where we have, oh, I don't have his name. Um, so we have, sorry, one moment. What's the name of our speaker? Yeah, I'm totally failing here. Anyway, we have an excellent speaker coming up this Thursday. Um, hang on one second. I think it's Dr. Peter Clark. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I was just bringing up the meetup page. Uh, yeah, so he's going to talk to us about uh, from the stars to planets, what is needed to make life possible. So that's uh, this Thursday night at 7.30, so you can come and join us there. Um, yeah, so the information is on our meetup channel. Uh, so yeah, just search for RAS Vancouver, or sorry, Vancouver Astronomy Meetup. And uh, that should bring us up. So, if uh, yeah, it doesn't look there's any more questions. So, thank you everyone for attending and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>